dear students this is beena marcus and i'm glad to meet you once again with yet another poem of the victorian age lotus eaters by lord alfred tennyson here for the examination during this covid-19 lockdown let us reduce the burden on the medical professionals by staying indoors you may keep the poem in front of you during this lesson you may also download the poem from the link below in the comment section let us get to know alfred tennyson first he was a representative poet of the victorian age he was also the poet laureate of great britain and ireland tennyson became a member of an exclusive group called the cambridge apostles a group that intended to bring about regeneration of the society through transformation of the mind of the people these cambridge apostles felt that poetry would be an effectual medium to bring about this regeneration it allowed the mind to break free from the shackles of old habits of thinking and outworn customs and laws imaginative freedom and political freedom were made to stand apart tennyson's early poetry with its medievalism and powerful visual imagery was a major influence on the pre-raphaelite brotherhood he excelled in short lyrics such as break 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 the charge of the light brigade tears idle tears and crossing the bar much of his verse was based on classical mythological themes in memoriam ah ah ch was a poem written to commemorate his friend arthur hallam a fellow poet and a bosom friend from trinity college cambridge arthur hallam's early death affected the poet deeply and uh, he wrote many poems in memory of his uh, friend it is interesting to note that tennyson is the ninth most frequently quoted writer a number of phrases from tennyson's works have become commonplace in the english language for example to strive to seek to find and not to yield knowledge comes but wisdom lingers the older order changes yielding place to new t s eliot the modern poet described tennyson as the saddest of all english poets because of the melancholic strain in his poetry w h auden maintained that tennyson was the stupidest of all english poets adding that there was little about melancholia he didn't know there was little else that he did now that was the most unkind words for a poet of such great repute now to the poem about the title and the allusion related to the poem the poem was published in tennyson's 1832 poetry collection just as we know that any poem is born out of inspiration this particular poem was inspired by a trip to spain with his close friend arthur hallam now the title of the poem alludes to the lotus eaters in greek mythology lotus eaters were a race of people living on an island dominated by the lotus tree and this lotus tree is supposed to be fictional the fruits and flowers of this particular tree had narcotic property the staple food of the inhabitants of the land uh, was only the fruits and flowers of the lotus tree because of the uh, narcotic property the inhabitants were always in a state of peaceful apathy or they were in a state of laziness a lotus eater actually denotes a person who spends their time indulging in pleasure or in luxury rather than dealing with practical concerns so a lotus eater could denote to such a person now the source of this poem this poem is based on the story of odysseus marinus described in scroll 9 of homer's odyssey homer writes about a storm that blows the great heroes marinus off the course as they attempt to journey back from troy to their homes in ithaca they come to a land where people do nothing but eat lotus the greek for our english equivalent is lotus a flower so delicious that some of his men upon tasting it lose all desire to return to ithaca their homeland 
and they wished to stay in the land of the lotus eaters. Now Odysseus has the mission to draw them away from this land and so to resume their journey and go back to their poem. Tennyson has powerfully evoked the Marana's yearning to settle into a life of peacefulness, rest and even death. The poem draws not only Homer's Odyssey but also on the biblical Garden of Eden in the first book of the Bible. In the Bible, a life of toil is Adam's punishment for partaking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Before Adam and Eve tasted the apple, they were living in a state of uh, bliss. But after eating the fruit of uh, the forbidden tree, they enter into a life of toil and struggle. Now, Adam is condemned to labor by the sweat of his bro. In this poem, the fruit provides a release from the life of labor, suggesting an inversion of the biblical story. So the poem alludes to two incidents or uh, references uh, to the past. It is taken from the Bible, an incident taken from the Bible, and it's also about Homer's Odyssey, where Odyssey is returning with his mariners and then they get they get they get off their course and uh, go to this land where there are people in a state of continuous lethargy now about the form and structure of the poem this is a long poem and it is divided into two parts the first part is a descriptive narrative and it consists of almost 45 lines and the second part is entitled as Choric Song. There are about eight stanzas in it, uh, unequally, uh, with unequal numbers. The first part is written in a Spenserian stanza. This is called so because of the Elizabethan poet Edmund Spencer used this kind of writing uh, in his renowned work, The Fairy Queen. Now, what is a Spenserian stanza? A Spenserian stanza is written in nine lines and in total and then it has eight lines written in iambic pentameter and it is followed by an alexandrian line so eight lines are there in iambic pentameter and the ninth line is written in an alexandrian line now what is an alexandrian line it is nothing but an iambic hexameter so that is the difference between iambic pentameter and iambic hexameter Iambic hexameter is called as the Alexandrine. The rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C with a paired couplet, one in the middle and one at the end of the verse. The choric song follows a far looser structure, both in the line length and in the rhyme scheme. Now going to the poem. The poem begins with Odysseus. Reassurance. He tells the mariners to have courage that they will reach back home after they uh, watch the show. The time they get into the show, it is afternoon and uh, they reach a land where it seemed always afternoon because of the languid and peaceful atmosphere. The mariners are enchanted by the land of streams and tall mountains and valleys. The mariners are greeted by I quote, mild-eyed, melancholy lotus eaters. These lotus eaters come and offer to them flower and fruits of the lotus. And uh, the mariners who eat the lotus feel as if they have fallen into a deep sleep and they cannot hear anything distinctively. They only hear the music of their own heartbeat. The lotus makes a weary of wandering and they choose to linger in the land of lotus eaters. So the person who eats the lotus proclaims that he will return no more to his homeland. All the mariners begin to sing about their resolution to remain in the land of the lotus eaters. They have lost the urge to return to their hometown. Now the Koryk uh, song has eight stanzas and I've tried to give each of it a small title so that we'll get a grasp of each stanza more vividly. The first stanza I have titled as 
resolution to stay. The Marinus Choric song expresses their resolution to do stay forever. First, they praise the sweet music of the land of the lotus eaters, comparing this music to the petals, dew, granite and tired eyes. Then in the second stanza, this question begins to haunt them. Why should they labor at all when in the land of lotus eaters, there is perfect a state of peaceful apathy? In the second stanza, they question why man is the only creature in nature who must toil. His inner spirit tells him that tranquility and calmness offer the only joy. And yet he is fated to toil and wander in his whole life. The third stanza the lotus eaters uh, begin to think that everybody or everyone has a span of life. About that they say, the mariners declare that everything in nature is allotted a lifespan in which to bloom and fade. And they give example of the folded leaf which eventually turns yellow and drifts to the earth as well as they talk about the full-juiced apple which ultimately falls to the ground and the flowers which ripen and fade. So there they're talking about the lifespan that everything is blessed with. Now, again, they begin to question the purpose of labor in the fourth stanza. The Maran is question the purpose of life of labor. They understand that in life, everything is fleeting and therefore futile. The Maran has also expressed their desire for long rest or death, either of which will free them from the life of endless labor in the land of lotus eaters which in the next stanza they will say is like a dream the fifth stanza uh, the maranites declare how sweet it is to live a life of continuous dreaming they paint a picture of what it might be to do nothing and sleep all day dream eat lotus and wash the waves on the beach such an existence would enable them to peacefully remember all the individuals they once knew who are now either buried or cremated, shot in an urn of brass or heaped over with a mound of grass. In the sixth stanza, the Marinas reason that their families might have forgotten them anyway and their homes would have fallen apart. So they might as well stay in the land of lotus eaters because it is over almost 10 years. So let what is broken so remain, although they have fond memories of their wives and sons. Surely now that in, after 10 years of fighting in Troy, their sons would have inherited their property and it will merely cause unnecessary confusion and disturbances for them if they return after a period of 10 years. Their hearts are worn out from fighting wars and navigating the seas and thus they prefer the life of a complete relaxation and the land of lotus eaters offers them just that. Then you see that the desire to linger goes, grows stronger in their minds. By choosing to stay back in the land of lotus eaters, the Maronites bark in the pleasant sights and sounds of the island. They imagine how sweet it would be to lie on beds of flowers while watching the river flow and listening to the echoes in the caves. Finally, they come to a determination that they will stay here. They compare the life of abandon which they will enjoy in Lotus Land to the carefree existence of the gods who do not care about the famines, plagues, earthquakes and other unnatural disasters that plague human beings on earth. These gods simply smile upon men who till the earth and harvest crops until they either suffer in hell or dwell in the Elysian valleys of heaven. Since they have concluded that slumber is more sweet than toil, the mariners resolve to stop wandering the seas and to settle inside instead in the land of the lotus eaters. Finally, the poem echoes with the mariners' verb to spend the rest of their lives relaxing and reclining in the hollow lotus land. In the conclusion, we see that Tennyson has 
he left us with a question about the ambiguous appeal of a life without toil although all of us share the longing for a carefree and relaxed existence just now as we are in the time of covid lockdown this kind of standstill experience will not be pleasant if it is going to be an eternal issue like that few people could truly be happy without any challenges to overcome for a short while but without the fire of aspiration and the struggle to make the world a better place definitely the urge to return to a life of activity will tempt them let's have a look at the poetic devices i'm going to mention examples of an image symbol enjambment and tennyson's use of this word scene at least seven times now the image we have the prominent image of the lotus here we know that it is a flower and uh, it appeals to one's sight and smell here the flower is a source of food which has the narcotic property as we have seen it has a capacity to draw an individual away from their destined journey so it is a source of distraction there is a symbol symbol of the full-faced moon now full-faced is giving us a kind of definiteness about the shape of the moon in the land of the lotus eaters only the moon has a clear-cut identity the inhabitants of the island seem to have forgotten their purpose and their destination tennyson has used enjambment the movement of the lines that matches with the mood and uh, trance-like behavior of the mariners the slender stream along the cliff to fall and pause and fall still seem let me draw your attention to tennyson's repeated use of the word seem now tennyson calls this lotus land as hollow and which depicts the seductive vision of life he also seems to say that mariners may be deceived in succumbing to the hypnotical power of the flower by using the word seem in the world of lotus eaters everything seems to be but nothing actually is their stay in the land of lotus eaters involves abandoning external reality and living instead in a world of appearances so the constant use of the word seems in line number 4 9 24 32 35 41 and line number 100 you see the word seem is used to highlight the gap between reality and unreality so the mariners are caught up in a state of trance they are not able to see through so thank you for listening stay safe and prepare for your examinations thank you again